So uh, everyone here, I presume, <laughs> oh, how do you do that? I said at five. March, March, this up here. So I assume everyone here is aware of the replication crisis uh, that's hit uh, the social sciences, that there's a belief that you know, findings, someone comes up with a finding and then no one else can come up with it, and further work shows that uh, the relationship dissipates. Um, so my argument, I'm going to talk, so start out all relationships dissipate except this. Um, and. Uh, So despite the fact that uh, there's a very small relationship between attitudes and behavior, uh, one person wrote, uh, historically attitudes have been assumed to be predictive of behavior, although this assumption was often held in the face of compelling evidence to the contrary. So we all like to think that there's this nice relationship between attitudes and behavior. Psychologists firmly disagree, and they've spent dozens of years and hundreds of studies showing that this is not true. And uh, again, there are, there are a lot of critics of the Supreme Court database as to uh, what it does and what it doesn't do. And finally, the fact that most relationships dissipate, that is the replication crisis, uh, I'm going to show that uh, uh, the except this is the relationship between the attitudes and voting behavior of Supreme Court justices. So, so here's just a, whoops. here's just a series of articles on the replication crisis to show everyone, in case for those of you who may not have heard of it, that I didn't make this up. <laughs> um, but so most of these things are about psychology, but it's not just psychology. I'm going to show you. I'm going to go back to my favorite graph of all time. I don't know if you can see this, but everything we eat both causes and <laughs> prevents cancer. So if there's a dot up uh, to the right of the line, it increases the chance of cancer. If there's a dot to the left, it protects against it. And every, everything they look at is on both sides. So this creates a great situation for motivated reasoning. So I tend to believe these dots on wine, not those dots on wine. Uh, on beef, I don't really care very much. But uh, so there is a replication crisis. It is not just in psychology. It is all, all over sciences. The reasons for this are many. Uh, first of which is the file drawer problem. As we all know, journals have a preference for uh, statistical results that reject the null hypothesis. Um, so let's say we live in a world where the null hypothesis is true. 95% of studies are going to, uh, where the null hypothesis, no, yeah, 95% of studies are going to uh, uh, fail to reject the null hypothesis. And because journals don't publish that, we put them in our file drawer. One out of 20 studies will find a relationship. That one will go to the journal, and that one will get published. As uh, King, Cohen, and Verber note, that the uh, accurate results are all stuffed in our file drawers. The inaccurate results are the ones that get published in the journals. <laughs> Second, time-bound results. So uh, things change over time. So uh, something that may have been true when the author first wrote it. So Sid Ulmer wrote a famous, had an APSR article on background characteristics and how they were time bound because society changes. Um, it used to be the case that um, uh, support for the notion that everyone should be treated equally was favored by um, Democrats, uh, those on the left and not on the right. But with affirmative action, it is completely reversed. Uh, free trade used to be supported by uh, the left, not the right. Now it's supported by people on both extremes. You got um, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump both opposed to free trade. So there's all sorts of uh, results in journals that are time bound. What Gelman and Lopian refer to as the garden of forking paths. 
So let's say that you're, you're conducting a research project and you have um, five possible ways of measuring your dependent variable, five possible ways of measuring your key independent variable, at, and this is a, a minimalist view, at, let's say five different combinations of control variables that you might have, five different interaction effects that you might test for. If you have, and so if there are five different things that you can measure in five different ways, you have over 3,000 possible regressions that you can run. So it's always possible in those situations to find something that's going to be significant. So uh, one example of this is a paper by Manning Karp and Carroll that looked at uh, age in um, uh, district court decision making. And they coded age as follows. They coded it as an interval level variable where one was coded as lower than 46 years of age, two between 46 and 64, and three between si as 65 and older. They looked at the results of this variable. Now they didn't code this as uh, an ordinal variable, but as an interval level variable, one, two, three. Um, and they looked at the effect of that on age discrimination cases by district court judges, and they found an effect. Well, Lee Epstein and um, uh, Andrew Martin uh, got the data, and they studied um, uh, 23 plausible uh, ways of measuring age. Only two out of those 23 came up with significant effects, and one of those was what uh, the CARP paper used. Finally, one reason why we have results dissipate often is fraud. We all know <laughs> what happened here. I, I won't go over. But the point I want to make is not that uh, LaCour was a cheater, but there are, there are in fact more cases of this than, than we might want to recognize. Uh, some examples, Cyril Burt in the 1950s uh, made fraudulent claims about uh, 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 genetics and IQ. He claimed that the uh, IQ rates among identical twins was almost completely uh, uh, correlation of very close to 1.0. Now, it is, it is very high, but it's not 1.0. He, he, the data were fraudulent. Uh, also, there is um, uh, John Lott. Remember the uh, uh, brandishing guns? This was, uh, so John Lott, wrote a book in which he, he just had sort of an offhand comment that when people are, there's an attempted mugging and someone brandishes, a, and the, uh, you know, the alleged victim brandishes a gun and says, go away, that overwhelmingly the, uh, the, the mugger flees and there's no harm to anyone. He was then asked, he didn't give any cites for that, uh, so, uh, and he was asked about it, so in the next edition of the book, he said that this was due to a survey that he had conducted. Well, people want, you know, don't mess with people on either side of the gun issue because they're fanatics. <laughs> so the people wanted to see the survey and where he showed this, and uh, it got destroyed in, I don't know, fire or flood or something like that. Uh, where did you conduct the survey? University of Chicago. Where are the phone records of all the people? So my department used to have a survey center, so you do these surveys, you have phone records of, of whom you called. I mean, there's phone bills for this. Where are the phone bills? Don't have them. Who are the people who conducted the surveys? I don't know who they are. Um, uh, so finally, so one of the things he did, so he got into this online debate, and then he created a uh, fictional person named Mary Roche or Roche or something like that, which was an amalgam of his two children's names. And Mary Roche wrote, John Mott is the best professor I ever had. I was one of the people who did the surveys for him. You people are all crazy. But John Mott, it was discovered that this person, this woman did not exist. But to be fair to the other side of the gun issue, there's also uh, uh, Bellicellus, I don't remember his, uh, the history professor at Emory, who wrote a book that won the Bancroft Award 
on guns and the Second Amendment. And his argument was that we tend to believe that everybody back uh, in the Revolutionary Era, when the Second Amendment was passed, um, owned a gun. So he went to, he allegedly went to uh, these courthouses where they had the last wills and testaments and found that actually very few people owned guns. So, so gun ownership, according to Belisellus, was not nearly as common as um, uh, people had thought. Again, don't mess with the gun people. So they went to find, you know, they, so some of these courthouses had been burned down and uh, there was no, he just, again, made up the data. So there is a fair amount of, there's some amount of fraud in, uh, in, and of course, if you have a fraudulent finding, of course you're not gonna be able to replicate that. So uh, my alternative to this is uh, the relationship between ideology and the Supreme Court, which that relationship has not dissipated. So I have a bunch of studies here that have used the Siegel cover scores to look at the relationship. And we started out, uh, Al and I, 1989, covering uh, the years 1953 through 1988. We had 18 justices. We looked at civil liberties decisions and had an R of 0.8. Then Harold and I, in 1993, we had one extra year, still civil liberties votes. Um, uh, the R, uh, still 18 justices, the R dropped to 0 0.79. I, I, you know, no big deal. Um, uh, so when we went back to, uh, this is with uh, Lee Epstein, uh, Chuck Cameron, and Harold Spaeth. Uh, we went back to 1946 and the relationship did drop. So when we go backward in time, the relationship does dissipate. Going forward in time, though, uh, um, Harold and I, in uh, this is uh, scam revisited, uh, we're up to 35 justices, and the R is 0.758. At this point, Howard Gilman calls us out. Uh, taking, objecting to the fact that we're only looking at civil liberties cases. I don't know if I have this right. So let me read to you a little bit of what Howard wrote. Um, in this long book, the core evidence in favor of the attitudinal model with respect to decisions on merits is outlined in just two little paragraphs. Um, Siegel and Spaeth compare the Siegel cover scores to what? All Supreme Court cases, a random sample of Supreme Court cases, a random sample of all Supreme Court cases since Warren? No. The Siegel cover scores are correlated with, quote, all formally decided civil liberties cases decided from 1953 through 1999. In case you are interested, the correlation is 0.76. Uh, believe it or not, that is the sum and substance of the book's proof for the model as applied to the final decision on the merits, where the model is said to work best. He then goes on, even on its own term, the model is not a general explanation for all Supreme Court decision making. At best, it is a partial explanation for a subset of votes that raise the most ideologically divisive issues of law. Other political scientists who refer to the model would be well advised to incorporate this moderating point. In fact, it would be a service to the discipline if Siegel and Spaeth would provide statistics on correlation between the Siegel cover scores and a random sample of all Supreme Court decisions over the past half century. So Harold and I never wanting to pass up an opportunity to do a service to the discipline did exactly what uh, Howard asked us to do, and we ran the data on all votes. And the correlation dropped from 0.758 to 0.757. So Howard accused us of choosing the data that best fit the data. I explained to him, no, we chose the data because the Siegel cover scores were overwhelmingly about civil liberties issues. Uh, and it never occurred to me to run it on all the data. But when prompted to do so, see that it really did not have any effect on this. So uh, what about 
today. So uh, there are eight justices on the Supreme Court, and the, the graph I'm about to show you changed almost by 0.01 with removing Scalia from it. So the relationship today is, so this is, I had this graph with Scalia. I've since removed Scalia, and the correlation is down to 0.94. So for the ideology of the justices and uh, their votes on the Supreme Court, there has been no dissipation whatsoever. If anything, the reported relationship has gotten much, much stronger. So finally, some words on Merrick Garland. I've done some preliminary coding of the editorials on Garland, and he comes out, I'm sure no, no one here will be surprised, as extremely moderate. So here's the Washington Post. You can read the comments for yourself. The New York Times, again, he's moderate. But the Wall Street Journal thinks he's a liberal. That's why I have you know, editorials on, on book, you know, newspapers on both you know, liberal papers and conservative papers. And I have to say, personally, uh, even though I am left of center, I much more enjoy reading the Wall Street Journal opinions. They're just much more fun to read. <laughs> um, so uh, as of two or three days ago, I had a preliminary uh, ideology score on Garland of 0.39, which would lead him to vote conservatively 56.1% of the time. And there, so the, because the fit is so good for current justices, the standard error of the regression is only about four points. So that's a pretty narrow range as to where Garland would be. So I'm not a political consultant. I don't go around giving political advice. But I'm going to break that here. If I were the Republicans, uh, and if Hillary wins in November, they should rush to, to put Garland on the court because he is much more concerned. It'll still be a much more liberal court because the median would be Breyer instead of Kennedy, but um, uh, much more liberal court than they would get from anyone that Clinton would nominate. Thank you.